Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So, I will just uh, start out by saying this. My sobriety date is March 18th, 2001. If I make it till Wednesday, I'll have eight years of sobriety. And the only... I don't... <laughs> Thank you, out of courtesy, but I can't really take the thanks. Because it's like Jim talked about, you know, um, it's because of people like you who help me along the way and it's because I am sponsored and I sponsor women and my husband and I are able to you know take our garage and convert it into a big book workshop and you know just because I can get out of myself but when I'm in self it's a pretty pretty scary place Um, there is nothing in my life today that isn't the result of what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me the highs, the lows, the whatever. I don't believe that any of us make mistakes. I believe that they are mistakes if we choose to continue to do those things over and over. Um, Jim was talking about he's a spiritual thief with uh, certain things he says. I'm that way too. And my sponsor, she's four foot tall, size zero, little bitty thing, always wears stiletto heels. And she allows me to use her last name behind the podium because she wants to be of service to people. Her name is Chris. She's in Coshocton, Ohio, and she will kick my rump from 800 miles away, let me tell you. But, um, you know, what she talks about, you know, when you make a mistake, Brandy, it's not a mistake. Twice as much of something that doesn't work still doesn't work. So when I hear her say that, then I know, okay, I need to change something that I'm doing. So then it doesn't become a mistake if I learn from that and take take a different action, hopefully a God-guided action. Um, just in um, sharing briefly about my story, I, I am a sole alcoholic. Um, my stepson likes to uh, laugh at me when, you know, I say that I tried pot, you know, an outside issue a few times, and... You know, he's like, that was more than you did it, you know. But, uh, you know, that's an outside issue. I am a sole alcoholic. I have a threefold disease, a disease of the mind, body, and spirit, and mostly the spirit. When I put in the alcohol, well, actually, alcohol became my solution because I didn't have another solution. Alcohol became my solution because I'd put it in, and everything would be what I thought was okay. The world, you know, everything was justified, all the wrongs, because it was everything that you were doing to me. Um, My, the biggest part of my disease is the spiritual part. You know, all of it's spiritual when we get into Alcoholics Anonymous. We don't get the spiritual awakening until we've completed the first 11 steps. So all of this is spiritual. But I am mentally, physically, and spiritually bankrupt. And I don't believe in walking the women that I get to sponsor through the steps without walking them through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have the nickname in Albert Lee, where I live, is the Nazi. And the reason I take that as a compliment today, because I am making sure that I'm doing what my sponsor did, and that's not giving me a watered, uh, these women a watered down message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think that's kind of how Dustin and I um, kind of, met via phone and then met via Hiawatha land, you know, because there was a man that came into both of our lives that, that, that changed the way we look at Alcoholics Anonymous and, and has really helped us be instruments of service. And, um, so, um, thank you, Dustin, for asking me to be here. I want to apologize in advance for that smoldering deal going on, but I went in the bathroom, hit my knees and I asked God, okay, you got to take over. So I did do some uh, note-taking and planning while I was uh, locked in the hotel room on my birthday alone. Now, I'm a good alcoholic. My Facebook status at one point said, it sucks being alone on my birthday. But you know what? I wasn't alone. Because eight years ago, 
I nearly didn't have a family or friends to celebrate my birthday with. I celebrated this belly button birthday in a hotel room because I was training for a job I probably would have not been able to hold eight years ago. So selfishness, self-centeredness, that self-pity, you know, it got wiped away once I thought about it and said, okay, God, what, what do you need here? So what do you do? You get into a role of service, get ready for this weekend. So one thing I want to point out is if anybody is um, has listened to Jim, I didn't get to hear the speakers before. I apologize for that. Um, I flew in late last night, and uh, everything here is so divine. You know, it's so divine. When we think about what happened with Bill W., what happened with Dr. Bob, I mean, all the way back from to Roland, I mean, he was supposed to see two other psychiatrists before he got to Carl Jung. And it's what my sponsor likes to call seconds and inches. How many times in your life, in your recovery, have you been seconds and inches maybe away from life or death? Be a car wreck, overdose, seconds and inches away from how many other things? You know? And, and everything, you know, young, seconds and inches to get Roland to get to Ebby, Ebby to get to Bill, Bill to get to Bob, to the 2,000, to the 6,000, to us here today. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. And so when we come to believe, it's hard to come to believe. Because if you're like me, my God was unforgiving, judgmental, punishing. I was never good enough. I didn't deserve. Or I was trying to be better than you because I felt less than. Or if you, if it was a particular day when, you know, I was feeling less than, you were better than me. You know, so it was a constant battle. And it's divine when we walk into a meeting and we're all one. We're all one. Uh, I want to keep track of time here. So, how did we become, come to believe in alcohol? Think about this. This is something that when I first walked through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and my sponsor's walking me through the doctor's opinion through page 43, you know, that's just step one. We get into step two, and she says, how did you come to believe in alcohol? You come to believe in alcohol by bending your elbow. I put that bottle to my mouth. I ingest that poison. The phenomena of craving takes over. I have no idea what's going to happen from that point. That became my solution. Bending my elbow became the solution. So how do I come to believe in God or a higher power? Or for some of us, it's the group, our home group, where we're held accountable. You know, we come to believe in those things by taking an action. Nine times out of ten, when we're first here, it's an action that doesn't feel right. It's opposite of what we normally do. You know, make coffee. Why would I want to make coffee for you guys? You should be making coffee for me. But as soon as I open my mouth and say the coffee is too strong, guess who's making coffee next week? Me. I learned that lesson in my first home group. Um, I actually sobered up just outside of Akron, Ohio, um, and uh, it's a little town called LaGrange in Ohio, and they actually let us alcoholics have meetings in the basements of banks. Can you believe it? You know, <laughs> they let alcoholics in the bank. But, you know, that, that first home group, you know, my dad took me there. My dad has uh, 23 years sober now, and, uh, you know, he's watching his little girl die from a disease of alcoholism, and he took me in that meeting, and... There was something in there that was beautiful. You know, Jeff, where are you? The Jeff from Anoka back there. Jeff, he was just showing me his picture from 2006, his last last arrest. And looking at him today and seeing what he was like then, I, I don't know Jeff, never met Jeff, first time I see him. But I just see the light in his eyes. Today, And that's because Divine, Alcoholics Anonymous, got him to the power that's keeping him sober, you know. Same goes for that first group of people. 
It's like, okay, they're happy, smiley, they smell good, they don't smell like, you know, the bar, they, you know, they're, they're having a good time, and, and they have something. But there was this disgusting part of that whole deal, too. That disgusting part was me, because I was a wreck, you know. So how do you, how do you feel better? How do you do this? I was just turned 20, well, I was 23 when I went to my first AA meeting. I did the whole three meetings a week and drank the other days for a month and a half until I got um, sober. And, um, you know, I'd go to those meetings and I'd just say, well, how are these people doing it? You know, I was reading the steps on the wall. I was hearing the traditions. I was seeing you guys get together for coffee afterwards. And it's just like started to click. I even went as far to say, okay, well, if it gets better, then how am I supposed to drink champagne at my wedding? See, me, up here, I'm running the show. I am not even dating anybody, and I'm worried about my wedding. <laughs> you know, and then little did I know that almost two years later, champagne would be the furthest thing from my mind as I marry another man in the program. You know, it's just funny how it works. But I want to talk about a few things in we agnostics. I'm an agnostic. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was an agnostic. If you aren't sure about agnostic or atheist, you know that the dictionary has become very helpful since I've started studying the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because even though no one was more than four years sober when this book that we're still using 70-some years later you know, the first 164 pages aren't, haven't changed, but even though nobody was over four years sober, they used a lingo that I just don't understand, man, you know. They wouldn't say this dude or this guy or, you know, as a young chap or something is how they use it. So, But the dictionary has become very helpful. And, and I'm, in we agnostics, you know, I was agnostic. Atheist is... I have the definitions written somewhere, but I'll just go with it. But I was agnostic. I found it hard to believe that there could be a God for the things that were happening in my life. And when Fred, on page 43, he says, you are, you know, I realize you guys are 100% hopeless apart from divine help. And it's like, well, how do I get divine help? That's, That's really our first glimmer of hope in the big book is when Fred's talking about being hopeless. I mean, we, we, we've been told up until that point that we're hopeless, 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 hopeless of, you know, body and mind. But the first real sense of hope we get is on page 43, you know, divine help. So how do I get that divine help? I keep doing the next action. And when I look at this, you know, we gain, on page 50, it says, we, everyone has gained access to and believes in a power greater than himself. Well, how is that so? You see this wall here? That's how it's gained. By walking through the steps. Um, you know, and when you ask yourself, okay, am I suffering? Did I come to AA to quit suffering or to, you know, or to, you know, quit drinking. Ask yourself that. I came to quit suffering in the end. And I'm suffering from that spiritual malady. So how do I stop suffering from that spiritual malady? I get up. I go to my home group. I make the coffee, even though I didn't want to. I just wanted, would rather fuss about the nasty coffee I was drinking. Now it's a staple to have strong coffee. And, you know, I make sure I'm there for the next suffering alcoholic that walks in. On page 44 and 45, I don't know how many of you have your big book. Um, A dear friend of mine in Alcoholics Anonymous that just passed away recently. This is one of the biggest things that he would point out to me. If a mere code of morals or better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. I really couldn't have wished for better morals or better, you know, philosophy. It was so distorted, you know, because my disease centers in my brain. Jim was 
talking about, you know, if it wasn't for his brain and not having his body, you know, he would have probably, you know, killed himself. You know, how he was talking about the, the body as the vehicle. It goes on to say, but we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us no matter how much we tried. How much does that happen to us? You know, we say a hundred times we're not going to the bar that day. And where do we end up? You know, um, we could wish to be moral. I could wish to be moral. I still have problems with that. (laughs) I'm moral. I just... Have a, no, I'm not going there. We could wish to be moral. We could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could will these things with all our might, but the needed power wasn't there. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed utterly. Ask yourself, did my will fail me utterly? Time and time and time again. Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than myself. Guess what? There is a God, and that God's name is not Brandy Dreyer. Obviously, but how were we to find this power? Here's your answer. Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. That means we have written about a book which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral. And it means, of course, that we're going to talk about God. How many of you cringe when you hear the word God? Be honest. By a show of hands. If you want. You don't have to. Yeah. God. Probably like me. Punishing. Unforgiving. I'm going to hell. What's the use? And I've had a shift. Starting... About three years sober, I really started to feel that, okay, God is a loving God. He's a, you know, that this power greater, God, in my understanding, is loving, forgiving. You know, guess who's the last person to forgive Brandy? Me. For anything. You know, but God forgave me long ago. Or the the power that greater than myself. Um... And, and the reason why I'm, I keep talking about the God that, you know, I had before is because I was so prejudiced to it. If you ask yourself, do you have any prejudices in your life? Prejudice is a big word, you know. It's a prejudgment. You know, most of us think of prejudice as to a race or something of that sort or a religion. So prejudice against God, I'm prejudging God because I have this judgment against him. Prejudgment. He's not good. Basically, I was running my life. Then I come into AA, and you guys keep talking about this, find the God of your own understanding. And it just, it starts evolving as I'm doing the service. As I'm listening to you share, as I'm reading the big book, you know, as I'm, as I'm doing what you're suggesting for me to do. And for me, came to believe has come in a series of steps. And every time I would walk through another step, I believe a little bit more. And it still happens for me today. But when I'm trying to take back over the show, I don't really believe in a God. Because I'm running my life. But if God's running my life, then things are going much better and I'm happy, joyous, and free. Um, On page 46, it talks about much to our relief. We discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to effect contact with him. This is what we must do. You know, this is what I was told to do. Have my own conception. My own conception of God has evolved, like I just said. And as it's evolved, he becomes greater. You know, 
You can't put him in a box. For me, he's in each and every one of us. But I didn't see that before because when I looked at you before I had a God in my life, before Alcoholics Anonymous, you were out to get me, you know? Um, and when you talk about being willing to believe, you know, came to believe, well, first we have to be willing. You know, are we willing to believe or do we want to keep running the show ourselves? I don't think we're all here because we were happy with the way our lives are going. So being willing to believe is a start. So then you start coming and you start talking and you get that sponsor that Jim was talking about. You start talking to other people and you start hearing their experience, strength, and hope. Then you come to believe. Well, if it can happen for you, it can happen for me. So then you start getting active in the steps. You know, and step three for a lot of people is like the big one. But actually, it's the simplest one if you look at it. Because all you're doing is making a decision. Then we move on to step four. Yeah, step four is not so fun. Step five, yeah, we don't want to tell everybody all that fun stuff about us. But when we admit to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs, we come out of that feeling on top of the world. I mean, each step in the big book follows has promises that follow it. And we can look the world in the eye. So then we're feeling a little bit more. We're believing more. Six, seven, eight, nine, nine. Wow, when you sit down in front of that person and you make those direct amends, believe me, I still have ones that crop up. And I don't want to make some of them, but I have to be willing to make those amends. When I'm sitting across from that person and it goes better than I had anticipated, there's more God. You know, it just evolves. It just keeps happening. Um, then 10, 11, and 12, you know, step 10 is, ooh, that's during the day. I got to, you know, I what I tell the women that I sponsor is a word, a trick word for step 10, WADMAT, W-A-D-M-A-T. You know, continue to watch for, let's see, it's on page 82. Nope, it's on age, page 84. I continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, I ask God at once to remove them. So I could see you in the middle of Walmart, and if you and I had a battle eight years ago before I was drinking... I will let it eat me alive. So I have to watch for that kind of stuff. I'll ask God at once to remove, call my sponsor, talk to my spouse, talk to another member in Alcoholics Anonymous, make amends quickly, if I can, to that person in Walmart, and then turn my thoughts to someone I can help. WADMAT. That's what I do. You know, with step 10. Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation. You know, there's two parts to that, prayer and meditation. I can talk a lot. The listening part is the hard part. And that's where I get my inspiration is when I can listen. You know, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out, you know. When we get a good or bad feeling, how many times did we think before going into that bar, not a good feeling. But today... We get a good feeling about going to an AA meeting, right? You know, we kind of know. We intuitively know. Well, that's coming to believe that God is working in our life. And then 12, you know, we've looked at our part, cleaned up our house. We're giving it away. We've had a spiritual awakening as a result of this, these steps. We tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. You know, it's, it's evolving. And uh, practicing these principles in all our affairs can be hard at times, you know, because we still, you know, we still are living a life here. Not everything we encounter is a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We have to learn how to handle the, the raging lunatic driver. Um, that's me on my motorcycle. Ask my husband. I don't like semi-drivers who don't see me. But, you know, I deal with issues like that. Do we all deal with issues like that and where we're just going, oh, God, that really wasn't practicing the principles. Does anybody relate to that? You don't act? Okay. We, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> 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 
<clears throat> but um, where was I going with that? But, you know, it, it's a process. And every one of us here has the same opportunity to come to believe as anybody else. It is not cut off because, you know, you're wearing a sweatsuit and because you have on fancy colored shoes and because I have birds and flowers. You know, it's not every one of us has the ability to come to believe in a power greater than themselves. You know, some people just, you know, they've had such a rough life. They've lost their dog, their mom, their spouse, their dad, their kids, their, you know, we don't come in here all rosy and pretty. And a lot of us are angry. I mean, Jeff's picture that he showed me, he was angry. But look at him today, you know. We all come in at the bottoms of our, what we think is the bottoms of our lives. And most of us want to die or have tried to kill ourselves like I did my last night out almost eight years ago. You know? But I was given the same opportunity that Bill was given, that Dr. Bob was given, that Dustin was given. And we do that by action. And by listening to somebody else, you know, the woman that needs to sponsor me better be pretty cute and pretty skinny. Because, well, I shouldn't say pretty skinny. I, you know, at that point in my recovery when Chris Campbell came into my life, I was at a point where I couldn't look at, in, in my recovery, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror and see a beautiful child of God. So she had to be that cute and that dressed up to have my attention on her. Because, boy, did she have a message. So now I don't see that exterior. I see that beautiful soul in her. But I've been given the same opportunity that she was given. Now I see a beautiful woman. And, and, you know, I just see beauty all around us. Because I was, you know, I did what was suggested to me. And, yeah, there's times where, you know, I just want to tell her, I don't think you're right. But I do take it into consideration. Because, you know what? She's got several more years over me than I do. And she's got more experience. But then there could be a girl who comes in with, you know, 24 hours. And I may be having a rough day. And God sends her to me. In that meeting, it's her first meeting. She walks in and her life is a disaster. And she says something. One small thing. I don't know how. And it puts me back to the I don't know how. When I first walked in here. Then the higher power takes over and says, grab that girl's hand and take her and show her the way. You know, it's, it's in everything. And so when people say the spiritual part of this, I don't get the spiritual part of this. It's, it's really all spiritual, and that's a high horse for me. If I hear that in the meeting, I'm just going, keep your mouth shut. It's all spiritual. And like I said, it's evolving, I guess. It's, it's an evolving process. So what I do... Um, is I ask myself every day, and, and sometimes I have to ask myself this on more than one occasion, and it, it's in We Agnostics as well. And in, in our workshops that we do at our house, Big Book Workshop, where we walk people through the first 164 pages, um, put a sign up on your mirror. God is everything or he is nothing. What will my choice be today? And... You know, most days God is everything, and then when I take back over the show, I got to say, okay, God, I give it to you because I took it back. And that's the neat thing about this is that it's, you know, when I take it back, he lets me hand it back over once I've been hit in the head by that two-by-four enough times. You know, progress, not perfection. Um. Just remember, I, I, I think I'm wrapping up here. Just remember when, when, when we're talking about, you know, coming to believe in a power greater than ourselves. Greater than ourselves is totally different than self-sufficiency. So twice as much of something that doesn't work still doesn't work. Does that make sense to, to everybody? You know, you can't just duct tape it like Red Green would say, and expect it to, you know, stay fixed, or WD-40 it and ex expect the squeaks to go away. When we're talking about 
our life, our recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, it's going to our sponsor. It's going to somebody else who has that experience. It's being of service to the next fellow, and it's beautiful how it just all unfolds and how that God does show up in our lives. I mean, if you're here at the treatment center, what a beautiful place to witness God when you look out your window. I mean, you've got the lake, so you're going to start seeing the snow melt. You're going to start seeing the trees bloom and the flowers come up. I think, you know, there's a gardener that's out there in the middle of the night sleeping, going, okay, I'm going to start plucking this little branch to have this little bud for the leaf to come out. And There's something greater than us at work here. You know, one funny thing about um, coming to believe in a power greater than myself, my husband works for the power company. And you hear the, you've seen the electric, maybe you have or have not seen the, um, you know, the electricity analogy that they use. But um, I flip on that switch, I expect it to come on. If it doesn't come on, what happens? I realize I didn't pay my bill. I still have to do my part, and then that electricity will be there. I still have to do my part. And whenever, you know, like like winters, does anybody struggle here because we're in Minnesota, that's lack of sunlight, you know? The winters are really hard. And I really, I, I'll be honest with you guys, winters are a hard time for me to find God. They are. Because we're caught inside and I'm looking at the dirty, the dust and the, you know, this and the that. And it's hockey season. And I will tell you guys right now, honestly, from the bottom of my heart behind this podium, I find it so hard to practice these principles at a hockey game because I love banging on the windows. (laughs) But um, what my sponsor said to me, Brandy, you may be in Minnesota, but you have life. You have two legs. Even if you're in a wheelchair, you can dress. You go outside and you find that God. And I, ever since I started hiking in the middle of the woods, it has made my winters more pleasant. Must not be too pleasant because my husband bought me one of those full-spectrum lights for my birthday. I don't know if I have some amends to make for this past winter. but (laughs) But anyway, so, you know, just... Keep letting people in as far as, you know, the suggestions and keep letting, because God is working through them and God is working through you. If you have a day sober or 30 days sober, you know, you are helping somebody and, you know, work the steps because we come to believe as a result of the actions that are laid out on this wall, not so much laid out on this wall, but what's in this book. You know, we can pick and choose the AA buffet, like my sponsor likes to call it. We can do a little four, a little five, a little six. But they're in order for a reason. And if we truly want to be happy, joyous, and free, we follow those directions. And um, that's what I've learned, because my first five years, I didn't know what the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous was. I knew it was there. I sometimes read the stories in the back. But on my five-year anniversary, I locked myself in a hotel room with my sponsor, And she walked me through it word for word. And the light bulb came on. Because I did the part. I got my butt to Akron, Ohio, put myself in that hotel room, walked me through it, let somebody walk me through it, flipped the switch, the light was on. And it's made a world of difference in my recovery. So I'm sorry if I was a space cadet. I really, I, I, three weeks of being on the road was a lot. So, um, Just very, very grateful for the opportunity to share today. If I can help any of you in any way, um, I have cards with my number on it. I would be more than glad to help you. And um, if not, I can hopefully connect you with somebody who can help you. So thank you very much, and I love you all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.